Hey everybody, it's David Matsumoto from Humantel. So, so many of you have asked us to comment about the various articles that have appeared in recent years um, arguing against facial expressions of emotion. So after a lot of deliberation, I thought we'd do this video. <clears throat> so first of all, let me uh, express my deep and sincere respect for all the researchers on both sides of this issue. I encourage healthy debates and more importantly, data about those debates. <clears throat> I think those debates are very healthy for science as well as for the scientists and practitioners. But most importantly, these kinds of debates and data are really important for the general public. I do wanna mention that I've read all of the studies and papers debating facial expressions of emotion, both uh, pros and cons. And I know or have, I have researched all of the studies that have been cited or, or, or the vast majority of the studies that have been cited as evidence for and against the uh, various positions that are out there. Now, I, in this video, I don't want to get into the technical issues of the claims uh, or the nature of the studies or the exact data. <clears throat> Now, my reason is that if I'm, I'm very happy to get into those kinds of discussions about specific methodologies and specific data or statistics or analytic procedures with anybody, with researchers or interested others, happy to do so. Um, but that would require a really technical discussion about that requires um, some, some knowledge and background about methodology. And I think the method, more importantly, I think the message that I want to impart gets lost really easily if we go down that path. Again, happy to do so, but maybe in another, another venue. I do wanna say that I agree with all the data that I have seen from all the researchers. And the reason why is that I believe that data and findings are generated within the limitations of the methodologies that are used to produce that data. So whatever the me methodologies are, they, you know, every methodology has some kind of limitations or parameters that, that are characterize the methodologies. And data <clears throat> that are produced within those parameters are limited by those parameters. And thus, I agree with all the data that have been produced over the years. What I don't necessarily agree with are all the interpretations or the claims made about that data. Now, parenthetically, <clears throat> If you really closely examine the, the studies or the writings that argue against facial expressions of emotion, they typically don't encompass all of the evidence for facial expressions of emotion or the universality. And that evidence includes not only hundreds of what we call judgment studies, but also many, many studies that we call production studies. Then there's the studies of the blind individuals. Then there's studies of kids and infants around the world then there are studies of kin versus non-kin and family versus non-family members and their resemblances. And then there's all the studies of the non-human primates and that's all of this is just about facial expressions. Then there's the all of the extant literature that involves facial expressions that, are, that it also exists. And most of the time the studies or the articles that argue against facial expressions of emotion don't encompass all of that. So that's one thing to think about when we find a study or two or a bunch of them here and there that argue against the, uh, the facial expressions of emotion. Now, what I'd like to focus on here in the next few minutes is the nature of the arguments that are made. Now, one, uh, one, one of our audience members or one of our, our uh, um, email list, uh, list members recently asked, can, can I c comment about the recent attacks on facial expressions of emotion? And that when I read that question, I thought, you know, these attacks have been occurring or the debates have been occurring for a century. That's a hundred years. Uh, when Darwin started this work in, uh, and he published it in 1872, which was actually a part of his theory of the origin of species, which was originally published a decade earlier. Um, Ever since then, these ideas have been debated hotly, uh, both in the lay public as well as in academic discourse. 
within the academic discourse, the, the start of the debates of this came from early anthropologists like Margaret Mead and Ray, Ray Birdwhistle. And those debates carried on to the 50s and 60s and 70s. Of course, we all know of the original universality studies that occurred in the 60s and 70s, but then even from the 80s, these same debates and the arguments have been occurring since then. And I was around in the 80s, uh, first as a graduate student, then as a beginning researcher and professor in the field. And to tell you the truth, the nature of the arguments made are essentially the same today as they were 30 or 40 years ago when I started be, uh, being involved with them directly myself. And that, I mean, I, again, debates are great and I respect the data and the researchers that produce them. But the fact that I see this cycle makes me think about other things. And here's what I wanted to, to raise, uh, a point I wanted to raise here. I think that the, the, a lot of the thinking that's been dominated in the, this field or in this area, by, and much of academia, is by what I call logical determinism. And logical determinism is really um, a way of thinking that things are mutually exclusive. They're either or. It's this way or that way. And it boils down to my point is right and your point is wrong or your point is right and I'm wrong. I mean, it comes down to what I call mutually exclusive either or dichotomies. And again, I think this is true for a lot of academic debates as well as much everyday thinking. One limitation or danger, if you will, of such thinking is that it more easily leads to confirmation bias. Um, I think this confirmation bias exists in, in, in the way academics think about this, this their phenomenon. I think it biases the way we create studies, and of course it biases the way we all, myself included, interpret data. Um, one other consequence of this way of thinking, I think, is that it leads to what we might call straw person arguments. So for example, one straw person argument I hear all the time is that facial expressions of emotion are the only things that faces do, or that they're always reflective of an emotional state. So for example, I'm pulling up one, one headline recently that I read about that said, facial expressions might not be reliable indicators of emotion, a study says. Never trust a person's face. Well, what happens when people or when researchers develop straw person arguments is that um, it's easy to think that um, because there's a position over there that I don't agree with or I want to test, I'll, 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 I'll uh, create a position by that theory and develop data and generate data that argue against that position when that position that you're arguing against was never um, uh, believed by that position in the first place. So for example, um, the thought that facial expressions are always reliable indicators of emotion is, is, is a straw person argument because no one who studies facial expressions of emotion today seriously believes that. Um, another straw person argument is that facial expressions of, of emotion or those configurations are always reflective of an emotional state. Again, people who study facial expressions seriously do not believe those kinds of extreme viewpoints. But it's easy to create such an extreme viewpoint that sounds like those who believe facial expressions of emotion do exist create data that argue against that straw person argument and thus say that position, their position must be incorrect. I, I don't think that that's the way, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to think that we would want to proceed like that. And in fact, most of the field does not, what does not believe that. I mean, it, there's actually, there's actually a recent survey of all of the most contemporary emotion researchers in the field that was published in 2016. And a survey went out to about 250 of those researchers around the world. And the results of that survey, I have it right here, uh, was that 88% of them believed that there was compelling evidence for universals in any aspect of emotion. And 80% of the, the most contemporary researchers believed that their evidence supporting universal signals in the face or the voice was overwhelming. So the vast majority of researchers in this field actually um, believe 
the 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 existence of facial expressions of emotion, but they don't believe these extreme views, and no one does. Now, I happen to prefer a more dialectical way of approaching this particular problem. I, I believe that faces do many, many things, and that one of them, one very special thing that faces do is create facial expressions of emotion. And the way I, this dialectical way I understand the face is commensurate with what we know about the face. And it starts, it starts where, with our understanding of the facial musculature and the neuroanatomy underlying facial expressions. If we know about all of the different muscles in the face, that there, there are many of them, and that how they're uh, innervated neurologically and neuro neuropsychologically, we know that our faces can create thousands of combinations or, exp or, or, or behavior. We also know that our facial behavior has many, many different functions. Of course, they are used to signal emotional states, but they are also used to signal cognition, cognitive processes, and sometimes specific verbal words or phrases. Facial expressions do a lot of other things as well, like what you're seeing me do right now, which is articulate speech, because humans have a lot of facial muscles in our lower, the lower half of our face, most of which evolve to help us for speech articulation. If you ever pick up something very heavy or watch athletes in competition, you know that facial expressions are also signals of physical exertion or physical effort. And then there's all the idiosyncratic things that our faces do that, everybody, that everybody's different on. So there's so many things that our faces do and our facial behavior has all those different functions. One of them is to express emotions. But because of this multiple functions, these multiple functions of facial expressions, it makes perfect sense to me that some experiments, some, experiments, some studies will find under some conditions that facial behavior is not necessarily a signal of an emotion. There's no question about that. But what is also true is that when a strong, true and strong emotional reaction is spontaneously triggered, and the closer that reaction is to something that is really meaningful in our lives, that will produce the impulse to create a facial expression, facial expression of emotion in people all around the world. That impulse may result very briefly in a, in a very brief micro expression, or it may result in a full blown macro expression. But the link between a spontaneous, strong, intense, meaningful emotional reaction and a, and a facial expression, corresponding facial expression, has never been refuted by any study. Sure, there are many other studies of other aspects of the face, especially studies where people are judging faces. And yeah, I get it. People can interpret face, especially still images, in many different ways. But no study has, has actually, that has actually elicited a meaningful, intense emotional reaction spontaneously has shown otherwise. And at the same time, there's lots of studies that have shown that the face does many, many other things sometimes with the same muscles that we use for emotion signaling. There's no question about that either. So I get all of the data. I don't, I, I happen to don't agree with interpreting the data as an either or. I, pre, I prefer to kind of understand this entire field and the enti entirety of the data in terms of the complexity of the face. The question for us is understanding when those specific instances of emotional reactions are occurring and when we can read them because when those occur on the face, they're different than everything else. So, you know, I've been involved in this debate in this field for basically 40 years, all of my academic and professional life. And I've been wondering why is there so much heat in this argument? I mean, I get why there's there's a lot of attention to these kinds of articles and part of the reason is is because if if you have a if you publish something that goes against the flow it gets it gets attention and um there's also a huge uh publication issue and the editor uh, editorial decision making issues that we don't have to get into here but there's a reason why people want to get attention grabbing research articles in their journals i i get that but I also been wondering, I mean, as I said earlier, this thing has been going on for over a hundred years. 
And I've been wondering what, what is it about this concept or this question about universality versus not that gets so many people heated. And I've been thinking lately <clears throat> that this that the question about universality is somehow related to how we see ourselves and humankind. And as as there, whether we see humans as fundamentally similar somehow or different. And I think that's a really deep philosophical question that probably touches us in a lot of different ways, maybe unconsciously or explicitly. But I think it's something about that that touches so many people. And one of the reasons why there's so much heat in this debate and argument that has, that has been going on for so many decades. Again, for me, I, I try to find both ways in which both sides are correct, especially in terms of how to understand the complexity of the data in relation to the complexity of the, of the face. As I mentioned, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree with all of the interpretations that people make of the data, but I believe that there are ways that we can under, find ways that we can understand the totality of the data by not negating one side or the other. That's what our research has always found. That's what we focus in our training and our research. And um, you know, if, if people don't believe me, all you gotta do every day is just turn on the TV news and watch spontaneously produced facial behavior in spontaneous, strong, intense, emotion eliciting situations anywhere around the world. You'll quickly see that facial behavior are the same facial expressions of emotion that we have always discussed. I hope this was interesting for everybody. If you, if you hope you like it by clicking like, and uh, if you like these kinds of videos, be sure to subs subscribe to our YouTube channel. Stay well, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.